roll sound and roll cameras. Speed. Speed. Action. Rolling right, guys. Do you just want to, in terms in the Jewish wedding, what's the meaning of the canopy? The idea of the wedding canopy is the wedding canopy is the most minimal sign of a home. And you're building a home to keep out negativity. Uh, and those idea is not just to meet for supper, but you're trying to build something which is lasting, which is going to be a fortress against negative influences. What good purpose does marriage and family serve for society? Okay, so family creates the milieu of compromise. And in a family, you have to always compromise for the betterment of others, and that will then play out for society. The great rabbinic scholar and saint, Rabbi Yisrael Salanter, he said, when I was young, I wanted to change the world. When I got older, he said, I wanted to change my community. When I got older yet, he said, I just want to change myself. I want to improve myself. Tell me about your own family. Okay, our family. We've been blessed with large family, more specifically 18 children. People ask me how many children I have. I usually answer one, <laughs> meaning one Moishi, one Baruch, one Sipi. You know, just uh, I'm trying to make each one a separate one, individual one. There's a lot of anecdotal material having a lot of children. Uh, uh, giving the kids breakfast in the morning, no, I don't have a patent for this, but I think it's deserving. Now, all I do is serve them cornflakes, but it's quite a routine because I have to get it done within eight minutes because if it's not completed in eight minutes, then they miss the transportation, then I have to schlep them to school, which is a compelling reason to make sure that it's done on time. So what I do is I put out all the bowls, then put in the cornflakes, new box, new box, new box, new box, put in the spoons, and put in the milk, actually in Israel, the milk comes in uh, bags. I get my muscles schlepping eight bags a day from the grocery. Put in the milk, now my, my rule is, is that you're not allowed to talk during breakfast. I mean, of course, uh, it, my rules are all equally ignored. <laughs> my breakfast table sounds like the, the runway in O'Hare. But, uh, so one morning, this is many winters ago, I decided to record the kid's reaction during breakfast. This is no chronological order. The first kid said, and I love when they give me the religious argument, First kid said to me, there isn't enough cereal in the bowl for an after blessing, for it to be a, you make a blessing of, before you eat and then you make a grace afterwards, but it has to be a minimal amount. He said, there's not enough here to mandate the blessing. Second kid said that she wants chocolate milk with her cornflakes. Third kid said, if she gets chocolate milk, I want chocolate milk. Fourth kid said that he wants pancakes instead of cornflakes, as if I knew how to make it, quarter seven in the morning, pancakes. Fifth kid said that the cereal's not, so, not crispy enough for his taste, he wants it more crispified. This kid said that she wants it more sagified and not so crispified. So you might think, why don't you just switch the bowls? Oh, no. Switching the bowls means an automatic cornflake fight. You never switch the bowls. Seventh kid, every family has a philosopher. Seventh kid, he, one day this kid will slay me. He always knows how to ask an existential question when there's no time. He goes, how do you know it's truly corn? <laughs> it doesn't look like corn. Eighth kid, her tooth fell out in the bowl. Couldn't find it, turned the bowl upside down. Couldn't find it, started turning all the bowls upside down. Ninth kid said that he can't stand the fuzz in the bottom of the box, you know, the granules in the bottom. Tenth kid said she loves the granules in the bottom of the box. Why did I have to start a new box on her when she likes the fuzz in the bottom of the box? Eleventh kid said that his brother picked his nose, put on a cornflake, and dropped it in his bowl. Twelve, thirteen, fourteen, originality here, said they want their cornflakes in a baby bottle. So I explained, so the baby bottle gets stuck in the nipple, can't get out. I was with my kids in Queens, that's a borough in New York, and uh, we were walking somewhere, and this German tourist came over to us and said, aren't you ashamed of yourself? So many children in a world where there's not enough food and population growth, and there's... So I said, you have a good point. When I have six million children, I'll think it over. Right, well, what does family mean to you personally? Okay, family is the great laboratory of how to love and how to care, and this can extend outwards. There's a dilemma or a quandary. Do you give because you love or do you love because you give? I think rabbinic theory is, is that love follows from giving. And the more you give, the more you'll love. It's the mandate of every parent to love every child the same. Talk, talk to me about what many would call the, the big questions in life. The big questions are, what are we here for? Are we eating to live or are we living to eat? No one is here forever, and therefore we want to make sure that our days are consequential and have significance. And this is where family plays such a big role. You want to try and make a, a life of significance that can carry on. If not children, then certainly students as well, that can carry on the lessons that you've endowed, that you've instilled. Uh, Viktor Frankl, who wrote that monumental work, Man's Search for Meaning, here he was in the bowels of the Holocaust, a Viennese Jewish psychiatrist. And he said there that man's greatest need is that for meaning. 
And uh, meaning is even more important than the desire for food or for drink. And if people don't have the significance of giving to others, then that's a lot of pain, which will result in addictions, alcoholism, any vice you want. And God gave man free choice. That's what it's all about. There's the glory of free choice. And we can exercise that free choice. That's doing what God has instilled within a man to do. Ben Carlson is the retired uh, head of surgery in Johns Hopkins University Hospital. He grew up in the ghetto of Detroit, and he talks about that every one of his friends is either dead or is in prison. So he exercised his free choice one way, and they used it a different way. Using that free choice, that's what God has given man the ability to do. And the truth of the matter is, is that using that free choice also is it's the same hammer that could build a hospital could build a gas chamber.